All right. First of all, thanks a lot for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Um, you and I haven't really like interacted a whole lot, if at all, during during our careers. But everybody that I've talked to has talked to you. You know, so there. So I have a good. I feel like I know you already because I have so many people that I know and have and respect respect you and have, have worked with you. And and so can't thank you enough for coming on. No, I, I definitely appreciate you having me on here. And then, you know, at, at the same time, just th- thank you for doing this, you know? And so, so I, I, more and more people, uh, you know, we have a lot of remote workers, you know, but still people are really trying to find new ways to digest information. So people putting out podcasts, right? So, so you're able to, to tell this story and whether it's seen through a tack P lens or not, I, I think a lot of these are super important, but yeah, you know, it's, it's very like, like you and I were just two of those people whose paths never ended up crossing. Like, so like, I, I didn't, I didn't work with you a whole lot when I was in or like Tommy case, right? Yeah. Like he and I just like passed, never, never crossed. And so, uh, t- Tommy's phenomenal dude. So, uh, so really excited to be on here. Thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've loved, loved watching your past, uh, ep- episodes, like the, the past guests that I have on that. And again, like I've known just for whatever reason, life never put you and I together. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, yeah. So let's take it uh, from the beginning. Let, um, I, I was looking through your bio and obviously you're, you are the same as like everybody I found on here, just fascinating beginnings, uh, fascinating careers. And I just can't wait to hear all about it. But um, you were talking about, you and I kind of came in around the same time. I think you came in around 94. Yeah. I was a few years before you, but um, it's kind of the same uh, scenario, same kind of uh, reasons to come in. So yeah, please let me hear, uh, let me hear how you, how you grew up, what got you in the military and we'll just go from there. You bet. Yeah. So, um, Tim, Tim Pachesa, I was born in Fargo, North Dakota, didn't live there a whole lot, moved around a lot when I was a kid from like North Dakota to like Delaware to, uh, Minnesota. And then back to North Dakota, we lived in Bismarck and then we moved to Southern California. And that was all before I was six. I'm not a brat. My dad is a civil engineer. And so, uh, you know, he, he just ended up moving around a lot. So I did all of my elementary school, like kindergarten through, through sixth grade, uh, in Southern California. And then going into junior and high school, right in the break between, uh, sixth and seventh grade, we moved to Kansas city, Missouri. So, uh, and then my, my family's been there ever, ever since. So I uh, love Kansas city. I am a huge Kansas city chiefs fan, uh, I was say. <laughs> but, but I was raised a Browns fan. My father was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, and okay. So, so, you know, all the time leading up to that, if sports was on again, you couldn't pick and choose like, like you can today. So my dad always had, whether it was the Indians or whether it was the Browns, he wasn't a big basketball guy, but, uh, but Cleveland Browns is, is so much a, a part of my identity, oddly enough, and, and just <laughs> love for sports, but love it. And, you know, also, also huge, huge Chiefs fan. So I, I will wear all my Chiefs stuff, uh, you know, night and day. But if they're ever playing each other, then I'm, I'm absolutely Browns. Um, <laughs> And so, so, so moved to Kansas city. I'm not from, uh, only like really my, my grandfather was a Marine in world war II. He was fighting in the Pacific. He was a quartermaster, but he and I, you know, when it, he died when I was 17. Uh, and so he and I never got to talk about that, which is a bit unfortunate. My, my uncle, Eric, my mom's brother was, it was a very, very decorated, uh, helo pilot, uh, from the army through Vietnam. And then going into some of the stuff with JSOC and the starts of JSOC in, in the early eighties. Oh, cool. and, and so, so he was a part of that. Uh, but again, he was one of those guys that that uh, PTSD uh, s- sadly took over, and uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, he drank himself into an early grave. Oh, uh, but 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 I remember like he and I, I uh, was at you know, and I, I wasn't around him much at all during during uh, during my lifetime with him. But I remember we were down in Florida, and he come down to visit, and he went in like in the nineties and took me to the movie Toy Soldiers. Um, <laughs> You know, where the terrorists take over the the, the school, yeah. and uh, uh, but he, and he was explaining stuff. We talked back and forth, and he was talking about night vision and this, that, and and the the, the other thing. So it was uh, it was a whole lot of fun, and it was it was really great. Um, just kind of. St- just having some of that perspective, not 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 that it not that it shaped me, but really that was really uh, probably the one and only conversation I could remember as a kid. You know, having military stuff, and then my freshman year in high school. Uh, January 1991 um, was when Desert Storm happened. Obviously, I was you know, watching the the D- Desert Shield stuff, and then January happened, and then Desert Storm, and and it was funny just because like I, I never really thought of the Air Force, but so help me, every morning I would watch the news and I check out the sortie count, right, see what was going on. Couldn't tell you what a f-ing sortie was, <laughs> right. you know, but but like I had the count was like this is badass, and you just see all the the air power, like man, Air Force, that looks that looks kind of cool you know but like shit who knows right, and right. then 
And then about two months into my senior year of high school is when Black Hawk Down happened. Oh. And so so even even when you watch the movie Black Hawk Down as they're in processing Blackburn and uh, you know, you, you and McGregor's typing in his information, he was born in 1975, like early yeah. ni- 1975. I was born in late 1975, yeah. you know, and so it's just very odd for, you know, and so when I watched that happen, come to find out there were some airmen on the ground, you know, like, oh, like I'd. Like Air, Air Force does does that stuff. That's that's odd. And so uh, you know later on, so that happened in in like October of ninety three. So I graduated in ninety four. In the the month, weeks and months leading up to that, um, you know, went and saw the recruiter, and and, and he's like, "What what do you want to do?" I'm like, "I I honestly don't know. Like I don't. I'm not from the military." And he, well, he's like, "Do you want to fix airplanes?" I'm like, "No." <laughs> mm, hard pass. Like, like I am not a mechanically minded dude whatsoever. The fact that I can figure out how to work a screwdriver that doesn't involve like orange juice and vodka is absolutely, <laughs> you know, you know, be, be, so, and he's like, do you, do you want to, do you want to be like a load master? Which had I known more about it at the time, maybe that, that like, like looking back now, if I were to have like a regular air force role, like man, like lo- load master, boom operator travel around. I, 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 yeah. that, that sounds like super enticing. So knowing what I know now, what I have done to ground combat stuff, perhaps, perhaps not, who knows, right. but those, those are just amazing jobs. But yeah. then like what walking out, like he'd even tell me about tag P walking out. I see the brochure for combat control. And again, it's, it's the dude and he's, he's doing a halo thing. He's got oxygen mask, weapon strapped to the side, ruck sack full delta right the dude's screaming down and then you open it up and there's the dude standing there with the motorcycle layout of all the kit yeah. like, <laughs> like what what what's this and my recruiter was like you don't want to do that i'm like no 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 this looks like what is this yeah, why he's, not? Like, he's like yeah he's like yeah he's like he's like no these guys like jump out of airplanes and and do all this they're like yeah <laughs> like, like that's, right. that's exactly what i do and and, and 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 that was it and so uh and he like he he wouldn't let me like he didn't he's like he wouldn't give me the pass test uh he wouldn't do he's like you can take that when you're in basic like, it was really odd like lo- looking back at it now i'm like what a dick yeah, like, yeah. absolutely what absolutely what wanted to fill his quota so like, i ended up coming in open general oh you know is is for all <laughs> for all of us air force <laughs> veterans like you know how absolutely dreadful that is right. um and then, and then went in there and again, didn't tell me about attack P, uh, went in, in basic training, took the pass test, got it, was going to go into to combat control. Uh, at some point during that, um, you know, is when, uh, the, the recruiter Warren Gardner at the time, I don't know if Warren recruited you or not. Warren was actually an instructor when I was at the schoolhouse. So, nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great dude. Yeah. Yeah, like super, super great, great dude. Like he came in and g- gave his brief, and I was like, "Well, that sounds pretty badass." Like, I was doing this combat control, like jump out of planes, be an air traffic controller, but like this airstrike gig seems seems pretty cool. And then, uh, but anyway, graduate basic training, go, go into indoc there, and my like my my first day, I met some interesting souls, and it's just funny <laughs> how how the world works. So, uh, so one of those guys or. T- Two of them ended up becoming like great, great friends. One's one of my absolute best friends is in, in Airman First Class, Chris Deaver. Right, uh-huh, Chris yeah. is now the commander of our of our schoolhouse, right. Lieutenant Colonel Deaver. Yeah, like phenomenal dude. Another one was then Airman First Class, Adam VZ. Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah. so so Ad, Adam Adam retired as like a two or three time command chief, uh, uh, retired out of the Air Force from being the second Air Force command chief, um, and then uh, I, I I met a. a a TAC P at the time who was cross training into combat control, but I have Andy Kubik. Mm-hmm. And so Andy Kubik uh, was, was very, very famous in the late, late 1990s for helping save then Lieutenant Colonel Dave Goldfein when he got shot down, uh, you know, out, out of his F-16. And so Dave Goldfein went on to be chief of staff of, of the air force for the people watching who don't know that. And then Andy went for the invasion of Afghanistan. He struggled with, with, with some, some PTSD stuff, but like phenomenal person to meet in some of those, those opening moments. I also met this, this at the time, senior Air named Ray and Ray ended up being Ray Colon Lopez, who just retired as the fourth senior enlisted advisor to the chairman <laughs> of the joint chiefs. Right, and right. so, you know, coming out of basic training and being in that environment and meeting those types of dudes, I, I think really, really set me on a path of, of just awesomeness and, and success, their mentality, the way that they attacked life, the joy de vivre, whatever you want to, you know, <laughs> you know, call it was, was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and then I, I'd had some injuries and I was on my third team a couple of weeks from, from graduation out, out of Indoc. And one of the instructors there was just an absolute dick. And yeah. they, they'd go by and they'd kind of toss your, your bunks or whatever you had to do. Well, this one day, like, like it was like purse, like he tossed mine. Like he went into the fridge and threw my food out. Right. It wasn't like I left it out. Like it was, just, it was just re- re- really, really odd. Yeah. And so uh, I, I went into the instructors there. I was like, you know what? Like Airman Pachesa here to SIE. And like, and they're like, what? 
Like it wasn't even during training, wasn't during water confidence, nothing. Just out of nowhere, I'm like, yeah, I'm done. Like absolutely had, had no part of it. And, and then, uh, and, 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 and kudos to them. Like they, they understood it. You know, I was like, you know, you're putting up with that means I get to be one of you. I want no part of it. Yeah. And I said, please call the TACP recruiter. And, and so they actually, they actually did me a solid and kept me around there. And again, I, I, I don't know if it was legal, illegal or not. I'm not sure if they, uh, I, I think they held off on submitting my SIE paperwork and uh-huh. just kept me on status until it was okay for TACP recruiting time and then pushed me over there. I, I, I know that they did take some measures to help me out to, to get, get me over there. And then that, that is, they say kind of like the, the rest is history yeah. went down to the schoolhouse. Um, it was really like uh, another dude, sorry, another dude that I met at the OLH in, in Indoc was Dave Goggins. Oh, okay. So I was yeah. there in Indoc with, with Dave Goggins. And then by the time I got out to the TACP schoolhouse, like he was just graduating. Deaver was, was just, just graduating. And so, so that, that was kind of cool. Went through, I was Eagle 39. Okay. Um, and it was like, uh, me and Rick Weingartner. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Rob Lilly, John Ashley, Harvey, Harvey Wagmaker, uh, was in there, uh, Randy Krebs, Mike Schneider, like all, all these like like good good dudes who whom I I'm very thankful to still have relationships with t- to this day. Um, and then I tried out for the Airborne program there, got picked up for that. I actually I initially had orders to go to Campbell, which would have been rad. But this guy John Ashley had orders to Shaw. He didn't want to go there, and so everyone else had kind of eliminated through grades or otherwise they weren't going to get picked up for for Airborne program. So I hedged my bets and I sold my orders to Fort Campbell to John <laughs> Ashley for like a hundred bucks. <laughs> and so, so I actually swapped, like did the assignment swap for me to go to Shaw hedging my bets that I'd make it through the whole airborne program. And thankfully I did like that, yeah. that would have been, been horrible. So anyway, um, <laughs> like graduate tech school on a Thursday, that Friday, I find myself signing into to Fort Benning and in, in the first two hours, I remember thinking to myself, like I have made horrible life choices. <laughs> And just showing up there and like, I'm not from an army background and I know my air force stuff. And so I show up there and I, and I see that the way that privates are, are treated, I'm just an E3 at the time. And so like, it, it was like, wow, I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to suffer for, for <laughs> quite a while. But again, th- thankfully that was just the army side of things. Yeah. Um, and so graduate there went, went up to, to, to Fort Bragg and then, and then it just really, got lost in the sauce of everything good and everything bad that a young airman could, could do. So whether it was hacking the mish, doing that to the best of my, my ability, partying and chasing tail, doing that to the best of my ability. Mm-hmm. Right. And a lot of that led to some conflicts here and there. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I sadly uh, m- made a name for myself as, as probably a, a decent uh, tack P, but horrible airman. And, and so I, in, but that that didn't necessarily bite me in the butt then. But again, good good leaders, good, good bosses uh, from like you know b- battalion level. My my first two op super squadron super were dreadful. I yeah. don't want to bring them up, but by name, but like it was just it was miserable. And yeah. I I didn't I didn't know how bad it was until we got our two new ones in Roger Cross and Mark Valella. Yeah, so, and uh, so I mean, like you guys got so lucky with those two dudes. You know, and, and especially like as as a, I think I was still an A one C by the time they showed up, or at a bare minimum, uh, a, a senior airman. Just just the the mentality, the modality, the mission focus. You could still have a good time. Like I, I you know, I, I I I would love to think that guys looked up to me in that way. But I'm here to tell you, there's no way that they could ever look up to me the way that I looked up to Roger <laughs> and Mark. Yeah, you yeah. know, like they, they they just really set an amazing standard for for two dudes that were tabbed two dudes that jumped into Panama, right? Like, like you have the leather bucket seats of, of what TAC P is teaching you shaping everything there. And, and I, I, I really credit them for, for so, so much amazingness. And, and like through, through all of my shenanigans, like Gary Parks had pulled me aside and it's so like, Hey dude, like you could be great, but you're shooting yourself in the foot. He's like, so yeah. just stop. Uh, and so that, that helped out greatly. Todd McCabe was one of those guys who, when it came time to, to my EPR and I'd gotten in a little bit of trouble, he said, Hey, you fill out your EPR. I'll fill out your EPR and we, we will see where, where they match. I filled out the X marks on the front, the thing on the back. I gave myself a four and, and, and I, 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 I told Todd, I said, Hey man, I, I am your five. Like I, I am your, your go-to guy. Um, but I've, I've done some damage to myself. These are all self-inflicted things. So I need to learn from it. I've got to own it. I've, I've got to move forward 
Um, but I, I promise to do better. And so like, this one's not on you 100% on me. I, I own this for, and I'm, I'm going to move forward. And so, uh, and he's like, yep, fair. Uh, you know, that's my thoughts. Exactly. Thank you for owning that. So I knew I was going to get a four. Yeah. And you know, you, you couldn't look online or anything at the time. Uh -huh. So when I went to go get my EPRs from, from MPF to submit my soft tech P package, I looked and Todd wrote me a five. Oh, dang. <laughs> that's awesome. I have four markdowns on the front of my EPR and I still have a five. Yeah. And, and Todd went in there and they're like, Todd, what is this? And, and he showed them two things. He's like, he's like, Pachesa, like he's a four and a half to me. He's like, so he was, he was, I, I was teetering whether I was going to give him a four, whether I, I was going to give him a five. But he told me, he's like, this is exactly what Pachesa told me. And he owned it and, and he marked himself a four. And he's like, and when he owns that four, that proved to me that, that he was a five and, and I, you know, forever grateful for that. Yeah. So, so, so that happened. Then, then I, I, I get picked up for, for soft tack P, which was, uh, largely like the worst assignment of my entire life. Yeah. So, so again, like, like me, me, young, young air, airman type shenanigans, like, like I, I was working there. I, I was working for rock. Ke Kevin Davis, you know, was yeah. amazing. Uh, Chaz Boca. Cause like we were all in, in third group. Um, what one of the guys there didn't like me it, it just constantly just had a, had a bone to pick with me. Uh, but thankfully at the time, Tommy King, Mark Lutz, uh, were there providing top cover, which was really, really, really phenomenal. And then those guys left and, uh, I was fired shortly thereafter. Oh, really? Now, now what had happened was I was deployed to Bosnia in 01 and I was down at camp Bootmere. Uh, I was stuck at Eagle base up at Tuzla. We're down at camp Bootmere where the siege of soda was where you could drink on base. Um, mm -hmm. and so I, I'd, I'd gotten rip roaring drunk, which was absolutely amazing. And another tack P I knew was kind of doing some shady stuff with some of my teammates and like forcing a bad scenario. And so like I raised my voice and again, like I absolutely yelled and, and it, it was really un, unprofessional. The bad part was by the time we drove back up to Tuzla the next day, my commander there in Tuzla had heard a different level of that story. Mm -hmm. He had heard that I'd had to be restrained, that the cops got involved, that I got put in cuffs, that I was throwing furniture, like all kinds of stuff. And so by the time I show up there, he's like, hey, you're on a flight home tomorrow. Oh, I'm, like, like, I'm like, for what? And, and, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, hey, um, and he's like, you, you know what? I'm like, I don't know what. He's like, can you tell me about last night? I'm like, I got mad last night. I, I yelled at somebody, you know, hindsight 2020. I probably shouldn't have yelled like that. He's like, and that's it. I'm like. Yeah, I like. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I go, can I go get the guy that that I yelled at? Because I I want to clear this up. And he's like, yeah, sure, sure. And I was like, no. As a matter of fact, can you go send a runner? I don't want you to think that I cooked anything up. Go get him. Have somebody go get him and bring him here. Because I I, I want to face my accuser or whatever. And 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 he came back and corroborated 100 percent of my story. So then then, what happened? That, did he change his story? Or I mean, did he change this tune about no? Home? Like somebody else had heard it. And, and, or, and, and I, I don't know whether they tied two stories together. If someone else had different things somewhere, you know, I, I honestly don't know yeah, how yeah. that happened, but again, but again, like the, the, the major that, you know, the guy that I yelled at left the major's like, wow, Chachi. He's like, I'm very sorry, brother. He goes, you're still going home tomorrow. I was like, sir, like, please don't do this. Like, right. this is going to end my career. And he's like, dude, he's like, I'm not going to tell anybody. You're not going to tell anybody. You're still going to get it, get a medal coming out of here. No one's going to be the wiser. I was like, sir, like these secrets never, never stay right. Yeah. This, this is going to, going to be a, a killer for me. And then sure enough, it was. And so like two months later that, that, that all comes out. Um, I was down at, at, at seven level school. I come back from seven level school. I get pulled into the office and they're like, Hey, as of tomorrow, you're reporting to the 18th ASOC staff. You're out of the 22nd ASOC. And now we have some questions for you. I'm like, like, like didn't even give me an opportunity to do the same stuff. I'm like, well, shit, here we go. Like decision was all already made. I tell that side of the story and they're like, well, you know, it is what it is. And then, and then they went, they went to try and, and give me an article 15 to do that. So they went to the army major to get a statement from him to finalize my article 15 stuff. Yeah. And that army major, uh, said, he's like, I will not write a statement against Chachi. He goes, if I were to deploy tomorrow, I would bring him with like 100% as my ETAC at the time. Nice. Right. Uh, and, 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 and he goes, he goes, he goes, I sent him home early. It's like, 
I, I trusted some info that came in. I didn't give him a chance to explain it. Like I never would have sent him home knowing what I knew. And the fact that I did now that, that, and this is coming up against him, he goes, he warned me that this was going to get out and it was going to be over. And he was like, please, please don't, don't do this. Um, so they, they fired me. They gave me an LOR and they put my LOR in a UIF. Oh man. You know, so, and again, it was, it was, but, but it, in all fairness to everybody else, my, my life, my career would not have been the same if that hadn't happened. Again, sure. I, 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 I was deep in shenanigans. I, I like to party. I like to have fun, right? I, I was good, good at my job, but again, I was letting some of those, those outside things uh, curb people's uh, uh, opinion of me. So at the end of the day, and again, like I'm happy to tell the story to, to anybody only because number one, I, I needed it. Yeah. And real for everyone who was involved in firing me, they have all, um, uh, reached out or spoken to me since then saying, Hey, sir, like e either any a measure of, Hey, I'm sorry. We probably could have handled that, that differently or congratulations on all of your success. This is, this is what we always, you know, saw in, in you. And so everyone, you know, for the most part has been super, super kind, you know, and save one, I've got a great relationship with everyone like who had a hand in firing me because oh, okay. at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm super thankful for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 funny how sometimes something like that, like you you in your mind, you were like, "This is career ending. I'm never gonna recover from this," and it's and that's the end of it. But it, like a lot of guys I've had on here, and myself included, you run into those into those uh, roadblocks. But if you just endure and you keep going and you have positive attitude and you learn from it, think that's the biggest thing: learning from it. You can overcome that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, and like it, it took me a number of years, but I, I was finally able to, to piece together just, just like you were talking about is, um, was that a failure? No. Right. So if I had, if, if I'd gotten fired and then I got out of the air force, I would have solidified that as, as a failure. Sure. But what I learned is if you endeavor to do better, if, if you have a failure, right. And then in that moment, you endeavor to persevere, to endeavor, to do better, you instantly turn that failure into a setback for sure you know and so and like anyone can can, can take take a setback you know right. you can be a, a pro in the nfl and throw five interceptions in one game and still win a super bowl that season right <laughs> you had a bad game right so i i had you know a, a bad part in my life but super thankful for for now that the perspective of that was just a setback that was a learning op opportunity and, and I, I i would like to think that my earlier bosses and the people there uh you know Number one, I, I never wanted people to hear the name Pachesa and think douchebag. Right. <laughs> but then number num, number two, I I really wanted to do justice to the people who signed letters or recommendation for me going to the twenty second ace off, or all the bosses that I'd had up until that point who who took so much time and energy into grooming me and developing me into the tack P that they always saw. And the fact that I that I I kind of squandered that for a few years was was really I felt really insulting to them. And I I, I hope that they feel better about it these days. Yeah, that's a good attitude. I mean, that's 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 exactly what you want in a guy if they they own it, like kind of like that four EPR you said. You 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 owned it. You you had some really good self awareness, and then you learned from it. I mean, you just ascending is the whole goal anyway. So, you, you know, and it, it was funny. Um, uh, ten years later, I remember like the attack P worldwide is up at Joint Base Lewis McCord, and and I just so happened I was in a parking lot when a bunch of the Chiefs pulled in. They're like, "Hey, Chachi, come on up." And I think I was. I think it was a, a senior select at the time, but like Vlada was there, Lutz was there, Cross was there, like all, all those dudes. And they kind of pulled up and, and you know, uh, the, the the whiskey started flowing. And then Lutz, Lutz started giving me some shit and he, he was picking on me. And, and, and again, like my, my, there's a lot of people who have mixed opinions on, on Mark. I absolutely adore him. He's a straight shooter. He's hardlined, completely different than me, but I honestly know how much he cares about folks. Like absolutely yeah. get that. But he was in there giving me shit. And I was like, hey, Mark, it's been a decade, brother. It's been a decade. I took my licks. I've done better. I'm now a senior select. Like, isn't this what you would want out of a former pupil or protege of yours? I was like, so if you've got something in the past 10 years, bring it up and make jokes. Now until then, brother, you got to let it go. Right. And, right. and, and, and good on him. And he's like, fair. And, yeah. and like, I, he hasn't mentioned it again. Like, and, and I, I really, I've really, you know, just like the, the, the mentorship in the, inside the tack P world has been amazing. But again, that was one of those things where like he was, yeah, he, he let it go instantly. He's like, yeah, you know what? You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, so from there, like when I got fired, I, like, I already had orders to Korea, uh, you know, and then like, well, like six weeks, not even six weeks after I got fired, September 11th happened. Oh, 
And so like, what a kick in my junk, yeah. like watching, watching all my teammates go off oh, to war, man. you know, sitting back there licking my wounds. Like what? A, like you are a turd. So yeah. that was, that was absolutely horrible. And then going over to, to Korea was, was one of those things to where, um, you know, like, like really, really, really enjoyed it. But then like six months in, into my time there, a young airman by the name of Curtis Krensky comes over. Um, and I, and I'm seeing him with the 101st combat patch because he had been, he deployed during Anaconda. Oh man. Right. So now like I'm watching this dude with the puke and chicken combat patch Anaconda as I, and like, I'm watching it, you know, from the ice house, like, <laughs> holy shit, like ugh, frustrating. Yeah. But then, but then Paul Ford PCS over there. So like I was working for, for Scotty Myers okay. and Scotty Myers was really, really great at Chachi. Just, Hey, here's a new opportunity that, that happened. Like, so, so, so do that. And, and like, was like, I, I adore Scott. And so oh, he's a solid like, he, guy. Yeah, like, 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 like he, he, he got me half the way there through like love and hugs and fun. Right. And you got like, Hey, like, do not, do not do this. And then, and then he left and got replaced by Paul Ford. Wow. And then nice. Paul Ford came up one day. Right. And Paul was like, Chachi, I'm going to kick you out of the air force next week. <laughs> right. Like completely different approach, but like, like each, each, each one, I, I, I give huge credit to yeah. and Paul's like, yeah, he's like, dude, you're a great guy. He's like, he's like, he's like, I don't give a shit what happened. He's like, fix your shit buck up, ruck up and be the dude that I know you are. Cause you know, we jumped together a, you know, a few times where he's at Benning and I, and I was at Bragg. So we, yeah. we'd had just a very uh, casual relationship, but again, w w one of the best bosses I, uh, and he ruled with an iron fist and I didn't know it at the time, but he was helping me build a leadership philosophy that is now sustaining me uh, throughout my, my entire life. So Paul, uh, Scott, if you guys are, are, are watching this, thanks for being my champions during my, my time of weakness and douchebaggery. <laughs> yeah, both those guys are solid. Paul was there at Benning when I got there, and he was instrumental in making me a better JTAC for sure. He was a uh, we were training for the comp a couple of times, and he was he was our trainer. And yep. man, it was I mean, and he'd won it before with Marty, so like they he knew what he was doing. He's just a uh, wealth of knowledge, phenomenal guy for sure. Like, unbelievable, and it was weird because like I, when I, when I left Carson or when I left Korea, I went to Carson, and Rob Arcario was at Carson. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> I show up there and. And I see him like Sergeant Arcario. I'm like, hey, I was just in Korea with uh, Sergeant Ford. He's like, is that a good or bad thing? I'm like, that's a great thing. And he's like, okay, you and I are are going to be friends. There right, are people right. who who can who love or hate Paul oh, yeah, for for, yeah. for you know whatever way. But he's just that polarizing of, of of a figure. Not people who don't like him never say like he's a dick or sure. just bad. He he's just got a, a very strong personality. Um, but yeah, but like like go, going to Carson was my was was like really the first time in my military career was like okay. I've got an opportunity now to be a different Tim Pachesa, to be a different Chachi. Like, and what is the Chachi that I want the the world to see? So that that was really I, I don't I don't think I've told too many people that, but that was a, a specific thing in my mind. Like, be the person that you want to present to the world. Like, this is your opportunity. This is only your 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 third assignment. And I didn't realize how quickly I would keep PCSing, which was odd. I was like, so you're going to be here for a while. So display the 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 traits. Um, that that you want to embody that that you believe are are wor worthwhile and that that ended up being phenomenal and then like you know in, invaded Iraq from there you know, at the time you know ended up going with Sean Mignon whom I at this point I'd known for om almost a decade um, his youngest child Jamin was just being born so he he sat back for the uh, the soft initial push into Iraq uh, and so he just stayed back for a few weeks to watch his birth and then he came out with us with third armored calf because we we're like like a month behind the the main push. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah. So and again, was was there like had 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 a really really great time and and uh, Carson was was wonderful. Ended up rooming with with two of my old roommates from Fort Bragg who were out there. One was now a cop captain, uh, John Cousy. The other one was a, a chef who'd gotten out after like twelve years. A guy by the name of Martin Jolly. And uh, and Jolly was just a phenomenal dude, and he was a senior airman when I when I showed up. Um, both he and Kuzi were like ten years older than me, and we were roommates. <laughs> they 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 brought me in, both in instrumental in doing that, and then sadly Jolly had developed cancer and passed away five years later. That's and right, it's just one yeah. of those like like him him as 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 one of my first peer mentors. His passing is like to this day is is rough. I think I have it in my inside office, but I'm thrilled to say that I have some of his ashes. And so, oh, no. ca you know, ca carry his ashes uh, 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 around with me. Um, but the, 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 
Well, again, going back to the Paul shaping some of my leadership mindset, you know, going into 2004, after the invasion of Iraq, nearly all of our squadron deployed, uh, except for like four or five people from like the admin shop. It came down for the annual award stuff. And so, um, you know, my name got put in, Brett Barbie's name got, got put in. He was in a, a, a sister brigade. And again, I totally man crush for, for Brett. Like if you <laughs> want to talk about like, what does a warrior look like? It is Brett Barbie, right, uh, you right. know, like through, through, through and through. And so, so all the, all, the, all these names go in our NCO of the year was one of our admin sergeants who didn't deploy. And, and so, I, and again, that, so I went to the commander's office. I was like, knock, knock. I was like, sir, I've got a huge WTF for you. I got, I was like, I was like, I don't get this. And I, I go, and this isn't about me. I was like, this is largely not about me. Right. Because right. I would be just as thrilled without more thrilled, thrilled for Brett or any other NCOs that I end up deploying with. Like, like this, this, this seems like an incongruent message. Like our whole squadron deploys, right. We invade a country and you give this and, and good on him. Uh, a Lieutenant Colonel, my name is Brandon Wagner. Uh, like phenomenal, phenomenal dude. And he's like, Chachi, I, 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 I totally get it, man. He's like, I see where you're coming from. And I knew we, we were going to get hate about this. He's like, but at the same time, I have to think about who's going to be competitive moving forward. Cause this is how we figure out our 12 airmen of the year. And admittedly you all, all, all the other snake eaters and fire pissers, y'all had great job bullets, but you had no community involvement and no, no self-improvement. I'm on the fence about all that, man. I'm like, right. I got it. I get it. But come on. <laughs> yeah, right. I, told, I was like, I was like, I, I liberated a country. I, yeah, I don't know exactly. what you want for a community involvement, but yeah. I, I thought that's pretty good. Um, yeah, exactly. you know? <laughs> Boy, yeah. That's a whole community of Iraqis that are like, thanks for coming. That are at a bare minimum alive because I right. exist. Exactly. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 but, but it, so, so, and again, the, the reason I, I mentioned him by name is, is it was one of the most straightforward conversations I had ever had with a squadron commander. Yeah. Right. And you know, he was, he's like, and I totally get it. He's like, got it. He's like, I totally get it. And, and you know, and, and again, a little bit to your point as well. Like, I understood his point, right? These are the things. And at the end of the day, at face value, we didn't have those. So, okay, fine. So going into 2024, I invented this thing that I call now call the Pachesa eight. And it was, it was like, what, what, what are the things that the Air Force is going to evaluate people on to be promotable? Because, you know, some of my, my lessons, I think a little bit, like I, I have some philosophical concerns, but at the same time, like like me working at, at, at Black Rifle Coffee, if they're like, Chachi, you need to do A, B, and C to get promoted, and I don't do B and C, that's on me. Yeah. Right. Like, that's absolutely on me, right? And so so whether whether that's playing the game, like – it's working with inside the construct of what you know, right, you know, right. so like a negative person, like, well, I'm just, you're just, you're just playing the game or I'm doing what I can to be as successful as I can. Exactly. You know, so like you can be a douchebag or you can be an awesome, I'd much right. rather be an awesome, you know, so, um, so, so created this Pachesa eight thing and it, the acronym ends up being corporal timid, which was really nice because it ended up being organic, but it's communication, professionalism, loyalty, teamwork, initiative, motivation, involvement, and development. So the first six, I tell people, do every second of every day that that you are alive. And the last two, do once a month in a manner commensurate with your grade, and you will find success. Right. Uh, it, and and I, I, I can honestly, like, I am proof that that system worked, right? Up, up until that point, I made staff on my second try. I made tech on my third try. And then I invented this, you know, and then I made master first time, senior second, chief first. I think you and I made chief the, the same year. I think I think you, you you were the number one guy. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So and it was weird because like I remember like going through this because as I was going through uh, like like lo- looking at, at all the all the, all the different people, I'm like, well, I'm not JD, and I'm not Ted Nugent. I was like uh-huh. like 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 Who those guys. Is. Those nobody's Ted Nugent. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but I'm, I'm like, those guys are probably going one and two, and then I went through. I'm like like if if I've got a shot in hell, like if we pick up three or more. I'm probably number three. Like I'm not one and two. Uh, and then results come out. Sure enough, like you're one, Matt's two, or Matt, Matt's one, you're two. Every, and I was number three. You know, nice. it's like I, I was right, 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 right where I thought I would be. Um, Develop uh, Chase Eight started doing that in 2004, and then I, I took an assignment to Germany, and I didn't know anything about Germany assignments. All I was told was don't go to Hohenfels because I was a training center. <laughs> right. You do not want to be an OC. Yeah. And so I'm, 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 I'm dicking around on, on the assignment system and I clicked the button and the one job was open and it was for tech sergeant and I was a tech select and I, I click it like, yeah, I possibly consider doing that. Uh, like a week or two later, I get an email from then senior Valella, who was the functional over in Safey, And he writes it. He's like, 
Timmy Jim Jam, what, what, welcome to Germany. You should be seeing your rip soon. Jeez. It's like, oh, what's up? Nice. So, yeah. so, I, so I got I got picked up for that. <laughs> and so I go over there, like literally I'd been a tech for a month. I show up there. And then a month into that, I they they disband the unit because it was like a debt out of 4 ASOG. Uh-huh. And they stand at the Joint Fire Center of Excellence. Uh, and this time it was at Spangdalem because they were building um, another JTAC schoolhouse, another Air oh, Force okay led JTAC schoolhouse, but this one, you know, uh, primarily for NATO students to come through as they were formalizing this process, as they're, you know, they had the whole JTAC MOA, we need more, more students to, to, to build this out. So, so, you know, I go to Germany and then that summer I go to Vegas for six weeks to learn all the six CTS classes for JTACery, right? Get certified on all their stuff, bring that back. And so, so my, my entire like two and a half years in Germany was, doing the, the exercises there at Hohenfels for those like what, two, two, three weeks at a time. And then they scheduled the JTAC classes around those exercises. And then I'd go for five weeks TDY over to Spangdalem to help like uh, Rob Zanuski, uh, Jason Meek, Nick, Nick Peacock, and, and all those guys like teach J, JTACery, you know, uh, across the, so that was, that, that, that was really great. And then, yeah. and then I was studying for master sergeant and made master first time. Cause I was teaching doctrine. I hardly studied any of the job <laughs> knowledge stuff. I figured I'd, I'd smoke it. And yeah, and that was, that was great. Nice. And then from there, I, I knew it was only, I was trying to extend in Germany cause I absolutely loved it. And they, they said, no. So I was like, sweet. I want to go back to Bragg. Like I am, I am a single tech sergeant. i had gotten my time at at Bragg, I'd gotten married and then divorced when I was over, over in Korea. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a single tech. I'm a jump master. I'm a halo dude. Ha, you know, I haven't deployed in two and a half years since I, since I've been here. Like I'm ready. Put, put me back in coach. Let's absolutely do this. Right, nope. Right. Fort bliss. <laughs> so I show up at, at, at Fort, Fort bliss. And, and at the time I, I'm a master select. So I was like, I was simultaneous and you know, like brand new unit. I was a third person boots on ground there. And like the first two or, I don't know. I was like, I think I ended up being fifth. The commander had showed up, but he was deployed. We had two radio maintainers and an admin. So, but I was like the first TACP to show up. But yeah. like for the first year or two, I was the squadron super, the op super, the first sergeant, the chief TAC guy, the chief C, right? Just as we were Jeez. building all this. Um, but I, that was that was my favorite assignment. So like I've got a whole tattoo sleeve, but this this skull and sombrero is born of the seven ASOS hustlers. And I was oh, able okay. to choose hustler as our call sign. Nice. You know, so, <laughs> so, uh, like that, like love, love, love that assignment while I was there. i met my, my wife, Allison, um, and just everything about it. And so working with Nick Sully, um, was, oh, yeah. was phenomenal. So, so like man crush for Nick got to work for Scott Losher. Um, so yeah, and he and I knew each other in Germany. Good. So I adored Scott. And again, just the way that, that those two did business, uh, was, was phenomenal and just giving up op- opportunities, let ops, handle ops and they, they shaped everything else so uh and they they if they're watching this nick scott i love you you, you absolutely <laughs> know, know that um and then i got my first air force assignment i went to osan um oh, okay. to the to the group uh so that was rad where i worked for then senior scott myers yeah, again yeah. so like i've worked for him twice both times we're we're, we're in korea um <laughs> and again like we're worked for him for almost, almost that, that entire year him and then our our colonel uh for half of that uh tick forster w- it was just phenomenal he and scott like we're a phenomenal command team and then that that got me like my, my first look into into some air force stuff i didn't know what a wing structure was yeah. like I, I i you know i i couldn't figure that out so got me some exposure to that got me some exposure to a numbered air force there at seventh air force uh which which was uh very interesting um and then that that was just like good good opportunity and, and then scott was a again a phenomenal mentor that helped me get i got a numbered strat uh like when i showed up there just just the way it worked i got like a number three strat and then i was getting ready to get like a number two strat when i pcs'd out but they held and held and held till senior results came out and i made senior so then they they removed my strat for that next oh. dpr they get they gave me dpr without it so it it, it looks weird but but you, you could see how late it was so sure. and again like like good on seventh air force uh general remington um you know for for holding on that and and yeah. truly doing right because that was that was that was phenomenal yeah and yeah. then from there from there i went to fort riley kansas worst assignment of my life <laughs> i i went to fort riley 
uh, to retire. I'd been in, I was a senior select, or I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I had PCS there. And a couple months later, I found out I had made senior. Like, this is great. Like, this is two hours from my hometown in Kansas City, Missouri. This is ab- absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and I and I absolutely struggled through shitty leadership there. Yeah. And again, like I loved Manhattan, Kansas. I loved Fort Riley, loved everything about it. Like, di- didn't have a problem with any of it. The, the, the Little Apple out there was a phenomenal town. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we bought a house. I was ready to plant roots and then just move back to Kansas city and, and rent that house to tack peas or like, like really, really wanted to homestead there in the, the, the Midwest and just couldn't do it. Yeah. I, 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 I suffered in garrison. I suffered in deployment, but then I, then I, I, again, another opportunity to shape a leadership understanding was I was getting more and more torqued specifically the 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 chief that that was there at the time he just couldn't see the human side of leadership mm. right it was all do 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 execute 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 and it was systems and it was black and white and it was it was whatever and like like one, one of the the probably greatest slash worst examples was there was a master sergeant there who um uh, who had the most to well, right? So he hadn't deployed in, in, in a while, a short notice tasking came down. He was going to deploy in about two or, or three months. And he was, and because of this was going to now miss the birth of his second kid, having already missed the birth of his first. Jeez. And so, uh, I get told like, Hey, this, this guy, Jason has, ha- has to go like, Hey, totally get it. You know, but he's got a kid on the way. He's like, well, he has the most well. Like again, totally get that. Yeah. I'm not saying we force anybody to go in right. instead, but can I just lo- look around to see if if we have volunteers? He's like, we're not submitting a reclama for this. I'm like, you know, I knew at the time. Like, reclama is a wing level thing. The fact that we think the reclama happens at a group or squadron, we're still under the same bucket. Like that right. doesn't matter. Right. right. And, and I knew that. And I, I was super frustrated. So I called the group chief at the time, uh, JC Campbell. And I was like, hey, I hate to be a rat. I, I hate to do this, but this is, in fact, wrong. Like, like we need to open this up. Like, I just want to look for volunteers. That's it. Right. Just I just want permission to ask for it. So like, if he sends a name, just know that his wife's pregnant. He's going to miss the birth of his second kid. Like, like, no, this, this, this cannot happen. Right. And sure enough, the name comes in, JC shoots it back. The chief comes to me and he's like, Hey, did you find any v- volunteers? I'm like, yes, I did. I have a volunteer name for you. Nice. You know, any, like I, I would have been happy sending Jason if there were no volunteers. And if this sure. was it, this, this is what has to happen. But again, the, like lo- losing the, the human side of things has, has, has been like always my, my, my biggest frustration. So, so I, I started developing and then this really carried over when, when I was deployed was I kept getting more and more upset that I expected our leaders to do better, to suddenly get it. And they never did. Yeah. And so I was like, why do I keep expecting them to do this? when I know it's past their comprehension. And then, and then in, in, a, in the, the moment that changed my life's focus, I asked myself the most important question is, what is an expectation? And, to, and to the, I think about that word multiple times a day, every single day. And for like, it took me four years to define the word. Yeah. You know, moving, move, moving forward, like, like, like almost so there. So I was a senior master sergeant at the time, and this is in, in 2012 and almost perfectly four years later, I'm finally able to define it. But in that short time, I was a command chief at the 305th Air Mobility building wing at joint base McGuire Dix Lakers. Right. And so, so like what, what an amazing monumental four years that that was as I started pulling that thread, right. Peeling that, that onion about how expectations, how we understand them, how it works with us and, and all that. So, yeah. uh, so again, super thankful for that negative experience because sure. I don't think it would have put me on the path that I am today. You know, and, and there's, and I'm, I'm sure you and I have, have amazing friends and, and mentors where you look at their careers, they were flawless, yeah. <laughs> you know, as far as that goes. But I, 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 I can also guarantee according to them, it was less than flaw, you know. No, for sure. Not, not I was flawless. just gonna say that. Like it's like we look at it like it's flawless, but then you you talk to these guys, and you can go back to the people I've talked to. Some of the, my you know these heroes that I look up to or have looked up to these mentors, and I'm like, man, oh, they they went through kind of the same stuff that we all went through, you know. And it's, it's all very it's all very uh, human and normal. And- you know, you know, and then or like like even even some of those people who who had quote unquote a flawless you know career whatever now look back with a lot of regrets 
for all yeah. the shit that they sacrificed not doing because they were so hyper focused on career. Like, man, I wish I, you know, I could have done some some things differently. So even if yeah. it is, you know, the the flawless, that still comes with a negative side of that too. Which again, I, you know, which is why like I'm I'm so, so happy to be here today, like giving people you know, an understanding of, of that perspective and how we can endeavor to do better and just, you know, get knocked, you know, you know, fall down seven times, get up eight. Right. It's right. so cliched. Like, so, so a absolutely true. It's yeah. It's been, yeah. So 20, 2012 was, was just excruciating for me. Um, like, do you have any other specifics or was it just like, just the, the clash of uh, personalities was the, just too much. Oh, all right. So, so here, so here's one. So, I get back from that. I'm sorry. I get a call while I'm on that deployment from the 93rd AGAL IG. Uh -huh. And they're like, hey, uh, apologies for reaching out while you're deployed. Do you have any time to talk? There were some IG complaints filed there at 10 ASOS. Oh, and they're, they're like, hey, what's up? I'm like, I'm like, am I in trouble? They're like, <laughs> they're like, no. Actually, like the reason we are reaching out is like, because there have been about a half dozen people who've said, this was okay. This was tolerable. And it got worse when Chachi left to deploy. Uh where like there was now the chief had just unfettered no access to yeah, just have... like like you know not knowing what a shit screen I was or right. you know, push back so so that that was unfortunate and then I get back in November of twelve and in in all fairness to the chief he pulled me aside he's like hey listen you and I are completely different people you and I see things differently we interpret we we execute differently uh he goes i would like for us to bury the hatchet i would like for to figure out a way for you and i to put this together oh, and i was awesome. like chief like chief i am absolutely on on board with that i would like nothing more than that uh and again it come completely and i was like hey you you are the chief and as as i i learned a few years later right if you've got if you have a difference of opinion with your boss your boss owns the opinion and you own the difference right so <laughs> and so, so i was like chief not not lost on me that this is your your show my, my only frustration is the lack of humanity behind some of these decisions. So yeah. if you and I can work and collaborate on that, br brother, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. And he's like, yes, let's, let's do this. And, and again, I, I give him huge credit for that conversation way more, way more emotionally intelligent that I think I'd given him credit for, sure. uh, probably, probably in, in, incorrectly. So, and probably much more, uh, emotionally intelligent than I was at the time. Mm -hmm. I just had it like a year and a half, just like hatred and vitriol stored <laughs> up. And, yeah. and so, and again, I, I, I gave him great, great credit for that. You know, and then, and then, and then two months later, the equals plus job pops up to be the pack out functional. I click the button and I get it. Nice. And I'm out of there by May of, of, of 13. Um, which I, and boy, like, which is unfortunate because like, I wanted to stay there. I wanted to live, you know, I had, had a house. Oh to, yeah. To, you had that plan. Yeah, yeah. You know, I had that, and it's like my, my hometown two hours away. I could see my parents and my, my brother and his daughters, like, and all my, all my high school best friends, like all still live in Kansas city. Like my whole group, core group of friends is 100% still there. Um, okay. so that, that, that was unfortunate, but then we get to Hawaii as the functional and it was the best assignment I've ever had in my life. And again, like Hawaii, yes, but just it, it was non-deployable. Sequestration happened. So not a lot of people were were traveling, you know, here and there. So I'm just kind of stuck on an island with my wife and we get pregnant. We had a nine-year-old at the time who was my stepson, like two years old when I met my wife when I was stationed in El Paso. And so you know, we get pregnant out there and, and I'm, I'm a functional and then I'm back on halo status because nice. having to do the, the, the PPPM stuff. Yeah. And so I'm skydiving on the North shore. I'm getting quality time with my wife and son and soon to be other son. Um, and you know, be, and it was just absolutely amazing. And, you know, job, job was phenomenal. And then through that ended up doing a lot of work with, with the command chiefs there. Um, so that, that ended up being great. So the first one was, was Steve McDonald and, and he was, he was a, a, a great character and he left there to go be the ACC command chief. And he was replaced by Buddy Hutchison. And then Buddy through, through a couple different opportunities, he and I had much more time together with different endeavors, different isms in, inside the, the tacky world. And then I ended up asking him, I ended up make, making chief and I was like, Hey, what's, what's with this command chief gig? And, <laughs> and, and he was like, you know what? I was hoping you'd come into my office and ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and then I get on the command chief list and, and, uh, and it was funny because I remember signing into, um, the Halicoa, the military hotel there down in Honolulu. And this was September of September of 15, uh, going up there and buddy, buddy calls me. So I call him, I'm like, Hey, Hey chief, what's, what's up? He's like, Hey, uh, I'm, I'm here in somebody's office. He, he, he wants to say hi. 
and and phone goes over and it's chief master on the air force uh jim cody and he's like he's like chachi jim cody i'm like hey chief how's it going he's like nothing he's like hey don't say anything he's like but buddy wanted me me to to share the news he's like it's going to come out here in a few weeks but congrats you you made the command chief list nice and i was like that is that is righteous right and so at that time i'd only been a chief for 10 months oh okay Wow. Which, was, which was crazy in, in, in and of itself. And then he's like, listen, he's like, he's like, you, you are uh, a young airman. You're definitely a young chief. He's like, you may not get hired for a year or two. You may have mm-hmm. to go. He's like, do not get discouraged. Your youth is both a good and a bad thing. So commanders see that differently. So like, I, I really appreciated the, the, the understanding there. Um, so the list comes out on one October and then by one November, I had been selected to be the command chief of the 305th Air Mobility Wing at Joint Base wow. McGuire Dix Lakehurst. And so, um, which is really important because, like, the day the command chief list came out is the day that Dave Bickle got to Hawaii. Oh, dang. And Dave and I have been roommates two or three times, been best friends since like 96. Yeah. You know, it's so like we're finally getting to work together. And he and I, like, we're in the same battalion. We're at Division TAC running the night shift together. Yeah. You know, so I, 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 <laughs> just adore him as as everything that he's done is in his military career um you know to starting up the enlisted weapons school right the first enlisted weapons school uh was just phenomenal dudes like yes i get time with dave and again i didn't pull strings this was the organic he was the pick you know but it was just it just worked (laughs) out and then by the end of that month our time together was was shut off and uh dang but did did an, an interview uh, uh, Colonel uh, now retired John Price J- JP um, put put me through it in an in interview and in in full chachi form at the end of the interview and I'm trying to be on, on my best behavior at one point during the interview mid answer my brain shut off and I forgot exactly <laughs> what I was talking about and I forgot even what the question was yeah <laughs> like and just, I, I, like I'm just talking I'm just <laughs> I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Like I, I just like straight up, straight up dropped it. Like I have no idea what happened. And then at, at, at Tavirian, he was great. So he's he's like, hey, chief, I really uh, appreciate your time. And he goes, he goes, full disclosure. He's like, you are one of my my top candidates. He goes, I'm very concerned though that you and I have very similar personalities. Um, and I think I'm looking for a competing type of personality understanding lens for me to bounce ideas off of. He goes, so he goes, if you are not chosen, he's like, this is not a reflection on you whatsoever. I just wanted to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and and I told him, I was like, I was like, sir, you know, completely get it. I was like, first and foremost, thank you for the compliment of an an interview, whether I was hired or not, this is a phenomenal learning experience. So, so that's huge Two. I, you know, I co- completely support that. You know, the, the command chiefs that, that I've been talking to have said that it's always good for the commander in chief to be a little bit different just yeah. to make sure you've got a, a more kind of all encompassing viewpoint on, on things. And then before I could stop my mouth, I was like, sir, but at the end of the day, your wing can never have too much awesome. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably what sealed the deal for you. And it's what sealed the deal for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've talked to a bunch of Comanches about that, and they they all said the same thing that like I they're like polar opposites of the guy that gave me the interview, and they're like, there's no way I'm getting this job because this guy I I was against him on every single thing, and next thing you know they're calling him the next day they're like you're in, because of that they want that that uh, that difference of opinion they don't want to just have a yes man. Yeah, you bet. And, and, and like su- super thankful for it. And then realistically, like when it came down to it, uh, C- Colonel Price and I were, were not that similar, you know, but like I got hired into an air, air mobility wing. So oh, he was yeah. steeped in the air mobility stuff and I'm like ground, ground combatant type stuff. So while well, well, our personalities were similar, our outlook was, was so vast that sure. I was able to be through my lens, kind of like a, a, a harbinger of truth in combat that 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 he really wanted for for his guys for somebody who really un- understood combat like articulate the mission to the airmen to give them that that felt need and then that i think that worked really well and again he's another great friend to to this day and that nice. that 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 assignment he was there he was he was there so he and i had a year together and then he, he went to be the vice commandant of cadets at the air force academy uh, and then uh, retired out of that job he was replaced by um uh Colonel Darren Cole go, goes by by Virgil, um, and it was and it was funny because like uh, you know just talking to him, he was always the bridesmaid and never never the bride when it came to commands, right? So it's so it was almost like like he he, he kind of lim- limped into that, like and yeah. he was an on time colonel, right? So if you're an on time, if you're not a two below or four below, you're probably not going to make general as far as that goes. Well, I am 
absolutely thrilled to announce that Major General Cole is doing very, very well. And nice. again, like he's 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 living proof that that you may be a little bit different. You don't have to be that on time guy guy or gal and still be recognized for for your awesomeness. Yeah, so, yeah. General Cole, if you're watching this, you know I love you too. Yeah, and then and then from there, I, I went to Ali Al Salim. I got picked up for that. Didn't even interview for that. Uh, great guy by the name of Steve Haji Hodge had called me up. And he's like, hey, man, you are my new command chief. Looking forward to work working with you. He's like, I got got all this stuff to do. We'll see you here in a few months. And uh, it was it was really, really great. And and he, um, and again, like both both of the wings where I was command chief were, were air mobility centric. Um, but, you know, I remember like doing halo jumps over Ali Al Salim during the old Camp Doha days in, in Kuwait, right? Pre 9-11 type yeah. stuff. So, so now being the command chief there was was absolutely amazing. Made, made great friends, had great chiefs there. Um, you know, so this guy, Scott Ransom was there, uh, Tim Weezer, Rico Hodges, uh, Chris Clark. Uh, Chris is still in, he's only still in, but like he's, he's at Colorado Springs is like the, uh, in, in, I think he's at Shriver, Shriver, Peter. I was like, he's like Peterson, like the base, the air base wing type command chief. And it was like a not, not command chief gig, but like these guys became uh, amazing friends. And, and it was, it was funny because uh, Colonel Hodge, the, the thing that I, I really took away from him, there was probably one or two times, maybe, maybe three times each where we would send each other home from work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just the, like the attitude, the stress, whatever, you know, you're, you're gone a year to do that. There were times like we do a staff meeting. I was like, sir, you have to go home. Like yeah. you are, you are too angry. You're doing no good for any, anybody here. And then he absolutely did, did the same for me. He's like, Chachi home now, home now, <laughs> like go, go. And I'm like, ah, he's like, go now. And uh, which, which like is number one, just a clutch move in and of sure. itself. But the thing that I like best about that was that next morning, he and I would give each other the best hug oh, yeah. <laughs> ever. And it was like a good heartfelt, like five second warm embrace. I love you brother type of hug and just, yeah, like absolutely adore that man. Yeah. And then, and then from, from, from there, like we're looking at, at next, next duty assignments and what I was going for, but my kids at the time were nine and three and the, like the, the, the nine-year-old, you know, I'd met his mom long distance and Allie and I dated long distance and married long distance. So missing him, mi mi missing Allie, I had gotten used to, right? So, you know, that point in the, you know, handful of years that, that, that we'd been married, like, you know, so, you know, Allie and I got married a couple of days before I deployed. She'd been in a car accident, want to make sure she, she was taken care of. So we got married. I deployed two or three days later, gone for seven months. I get back. And then a month later, I get orders to Korea. So oh, now that I'm man. gone for a year, then I get back to, then we moved to Riley together. And like a year after that, I'm deployed for seven months. And, you know, and so, so this was now, but now we've got the newborn, which I was not used to missing. <laughs> right, right. And then, and then I saw it all. I was like, wow. Like, and then, and then again, Buddy Hutchison retired and he was General Lori Robinson's senior enlisted advisor at Northcom. He retired after having had a wildly successful career, like a, amazing dude but then the next day the air force just went on and right. i saw this but i'm like well i'm not air force pedigree like i'm never gonna be chief master sergeant of of the air force and and even then you'd only be relevant to such a small portion of the population yeah. is it worth it i was like it is not and so i called the acc command chief i called the centcom or a centaf command chief called a acc command chief or like hey i'm 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 done turning my star no harm no 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 foul i just want no more of this i just want i just want to be a dad like i love it good on everybody else took one more assignment to fort hood re retired and been living here in phoenix for going on five years now nice yeah we talked about that before um for hit record and it, it people feel and i've talked about this with some other guys too they just forget that while you are an important piece of that puzzle, you, there's other pieces that look just like you. So if you if you're done, if you want to be done with it, be done with it, and someone else will come right in and, and fill your shoes. I mean, it's not there. You are not irreplaceable. Not to say that you're not awesome. You're awesome. The guys that I've talked to are awesome. Uh, the guys I've lost were awesome. I mean, when I was, you know, at Benning, there's a couple of guys who wanted to do other things. They wanted to fly helicopters. They wanted to go CCT. They wanted to do, you know, go to CAG. And I'm like, yeah, go do all that stuff. Go ahead. Or they want to yeah. get out and, you know, I'm like, yes, please. That's a great idea, you know, because, you know, someone else will want yeah. to fill those shoes. So, yeah. You know, and then, and then like re realistically, like the 
the true measure of your awesomeness as an NCO or senior NCO should be, have you prepared the next generation to fill your shoes? Right. So if I'm good and I think as I am as good as I believe I am, then there, sh there should be zero hiccup whatsoever. Right. The minute I leave, right. Then next, next man up, the people are absolutely ready. And like uh, we've, we've, I, you know, I think we've done a great job and again in the TACP world. Yes. But really in the air force and or military, most times people leave and there's no blip, right? There's, there's, there's no hiccup. There's, there's no gaps because we are always building that next level of war fighter to step up. Right. That's right. And usually they have somebody waiting in the wings They're, they can, you kind of project your, your exit. Okay, cool. Well, he's leaving. Where's the next new guy or where's the next good guy to come in? It's for sure. Yeah. I don't want to, if you don't want to talk about it, it's fine, but did you want to go back and talk about your deployments at all or any kind of like, you know, your, was there anything significant in those that you wanted to cover or, I mean, you know, the, the, the first one that, that I had my, my first deployment was to Camp Doha as a young airman in 1998. And I, I was a brand new ETAC had just graduated in like December of 97, got my certification in January of 98. And then I went up to my boss's office. I was like, hey, are, are there any deployments coming up? He's like, and he goes, why? I'm like, well, I know I'm a brand new JTAG or ETAC. He goes like, but I also know I'm very inexperienced. And I know that dudes can get a lot of reps over there. And I, I would really like to do that. I'd like to get this rid of this lame duck. Yeah, he's, he's certified, but is he truly qualified? And so like, oh, actually one dropped yesterday. We were going to bring it up at, at the, our morning 930 meeting. He's like, no, perfect. You're in. I'm like, oh, all right, rad. And so, uh, went, went over there and was, and was super thankful for that deployment. Saddam, had, you know, was, was starting to spout off again. So all the intrinsic action dudes coming out of Stewart were, were there. So, um, you know, like we were in tech school together, but Charlie Kebaugh was over there. Kevin LaBuddy, right. Who oh, ended yeah. up go, go, going to do some, some good, good other things, uh, was, was th there as well. And again, that was kind of my, my first experience truly spending quality time with dudes from other units and seeing the different mentalities, things of that nature. So that ended up being a lot of fun. That 2001 deployment to Bosnia was super, super monumental in the grand scheme of things, right? So I probably couldn't ask for a better one. Uh, the invasion of Iraq in, in 003 was actually, I was there for like four months, left for a month, came back four months later. And at the time, like my, my airman to go with me that entire time was then A1C Eddie Ramirez. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you know, who's now a captain, if not major we weapon school patch was up at, at uh, uh, Fairbanks there for a, a number of years, but super yeah, thankful great guy. for, awesome for, for guy. him, you know, and, and like he did great things in, in, in his career. And so, so doing operations with him, I remember he and I driving in our Humvee from Kuwait to Baghdad, and this is in April of 2003. And we bought like a, a a battery powered CD player. Cause that's all they had. And the only right. CDs that you could buy at the shitty little shop at were Dixie chick CDs. Cause nobody was <laughs> buying them because right. of their anti Bush rhetoric, you know, like we're embarrassed. He's, he's from Texas. Anyway, he and I are driving along and the, and the, the song traveling soldier comes on. I don't know if, if you're familiar. I it's don't like think a, I'm not, not familiar. It was with a that, song yeah. about this Vietnam era. Like this dude has nowhere to go. So he goes inside a diner, talks to this, uh, you know, like his, his numbers up, he's going to get ready to go to basic training and then ship out, talks to this girl from high school, who's his waitress. And then spending some time together and like become boyfriend, girlfriend, or just writing letters back and forth. And he's from their hometown, but he didn't really have anybody. And so she was writing him and, you know, hearing some stuff from Vietnam. And then all of a sudden one Friday night at a football game, they announce his name as one of the people killed in action. Oh, and like there man. she was under the the bleachers crying. And so for me, like I've been recently divorced. Uh, and, and so, and, and so it was, it was just odd. So here I'm deploying to war. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I, well, I wasn't even divorced yet. Like we're going through the motions, but, but now like I got, you know, p pending divorce. So it's kind of hitting me on a personal level. Like, sure. <laughs> like tears, tears <laughs> are kind of forming and not streaming down my face, but kind of running down. Yeah, yeah. I look over <laughs> Eddie's crying because he's got a brand new girlfriend who's been his wife for years and years and, and years now. Oh like God. so, he and I look over at each other like, man, <laughs> you know, like, it was just the funniest thing. Like of of all things, he and I crying to a Dixie it, Chicks song, convoying up to Baghdad for the yeah, invasion of Iraq. Right. Um, oh man. And then and then twenty twenty twelve, uh, like through all of that badness. Um, was 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 kind of just odd and bad. That was also the same deployment where where Dave Gray got killed, oh, and okay. so 
Dave I'd known for for years and years and years, and, and so he and I had spent Fourth of July together. Uh, he he was up at, at at Bagram, and we were kind of farming him out to the different brigades to kind of help them to get them set up as we're kind of reworking Afghanistan. We're counting the boots on ground, so we're reporting our bog numbers, and we're having to really downsize. So he's helping this and trying to figure out what right looks like. So he was just everyone's champion, and the squadron commander was kind of placing him anywhere that, and again, not not necessarily that, that we had a problem spot, but anywhere that that he think D Dave could kind of uh, bring balance to the force. Sure. Uh, and so I remember like he and I running a 5k together there on Bagram on, uh, on, on 4th of July with the team just, just having a great time. And then there was, you know, uh, eight August, 2012, he gets killed. And uh, you know, so that was, that was, that was really tough. And, and, you know, seeing his flag draped body bag kind of come up to, to Bagram uh, was, was significant. And I was one of the pallbearers to put him on the, the, the angel flight home. Um, that was, that, that was tough, uh, you know, as, 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 as far as that goes. And, and so working with the, the, the different units there, and then I was just struggling internally. So, so leaving that deployment and then coming home and I, I got home about, I'd say about three months later, um, my, my wife noticed a significant change and, and, and I, I honestly did, did too. And, you know, like the, the, the most amazing part of deployments is like, you're never really alone which is, which yeah. is bad at, at, at the time. But then all of a sudden you come home, you know, you do all the, all the in-processing stuff and you have your, your, you know, two weeks free. So what do you do? You go back home and the silence is deafening. Mm -hmm. And all I was doing was like writing back to the dudes back at Bagram, you know, or the dudes <laughs> like, Hey, what's up or doing this or hitting the bottle, you know? Right. And so, and again, not, not that I had a drinking problem, but I was definitely drinking too much you know, sure. as far as that goes. And so it was in my wife's like, are, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. It was just, it was just like super, super tough. And so, you know, my, my wife and I have probably gone through marriage counseling at every point in our marriage and every different assignment, like even here in Phoenix. Cause you know, I spent the last two years of my career away from she and the kids. Yeah. Um, and so like us reintegrating, like reintegrating dad, reintegrating husband, you know, like was, was again, significant emotional event, but like that, sure. that 2012 deployment was, was just tough. Uh, yeah. and, and so, but, but even so like my, our, uh, our happy accident, baby Jackson, who's three years old <laughs> is actually, uh, Jackson gray, Pachesa, oh, okay. um, which I'm, I'm, I'm su super thankful for. And, and Heather, Heather gray has, uh, approved that that naming oh, and so okay. <laughs> she's she's been been very generous and then our nine-year-old um is actually running brett pachesa and brett uh that name comes after brett carnathan was one of my fellow teammates one of the original seven hustlers at seven asos like who stood that up together was again just one of the plank owners amazing uh, uh, amazing guy sadly who uh who was killed in a single car accident in october of 2013 there in mm -hmm. el paso while his wife was like five, six months pregnant. Oh man. Uh, and so, and again, like, 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 and it's, and it's odd just and again, going back to the whole expectations piece, I mourn Brett harder than I mourn anybody else because it was so unexpected. And like Dave yeah. Gray, who was a great friend, like, you know, that's, that's just a byproduct of warfare. Some of our right. buddies aren't going to come home and I don't hate the enemy for it. Right. The enemy right. does what the enemy does. They kill them. It's not like F those guys or, or like, I don't have anything bad to say about the enemy. Right. They use what tactics they can to be the most impactful. We do that with bombs. They do that with suicide vests and VBIDs. And again, some questionably moral stuff, sure. but through their lens, I get you know, that, that they don't have all those other things. So they have to be extreme. So like, yeah. I don't, I don't hold them accountable for that because that's the byproduct of, of, of warfare. But yeah, yeah, Brett's, Brett's loss is, uh, that, that is, that's the one that haunted me for years and, uh, a huge thanks to Jared Taylor, uh, in, in retirement, I was actually his personal exec for about a year. Oh and God. then, uh, he went into Mexico. He sits on the board of an organization called veterans exploring treatment solutions mm -hmm. that, uh, provides psychedelic PTSD treatment and therapy to special operators down in, 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 in Mexico. Like they, mm -hmm. they, they fund all the money and then they work, they pay the or organizations there. So Jared had gone through it with Marcus Luttrell yeah. and, and so some other folks. And he came back and he's like, Tim, you are going And in that, that psychedelic, I had never done one psychedelic before I went down there and it, it was absolutely life-changing. And yeah. so that has helped me tackle my demons. And again, I'm a, 
pretty happy guy, you know, for, and I'm, I'm a high energy type of dude. So I, you know, I, I'm not sure how much I was or wasn't struggling as far as that goes, other than I feel like I just did an engine rebuild on my brain. Sure. You know, through, through all of that. So if anyone out there is listening or has questions, please reach out, uh, talk to me, uh, hit, hit, hit me up at, at and, and any time, happy to talk about it. But those psychedelics are amazingly powerful. And thankfully through vets, I was just down at the, their gala fundraiser in November. Uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw was there getting this bill passed and the bill did pass and Biden signed it into law for experimental treatment for veterans using psychedelics as part of a PTSD treatment protocol. So I'm really, really excited for how this is going to shape out. Nice. Yeah. I've never heard uh, anything bad about anybody going down there. Like I know a lot of guys that have done that and they're all just like, it's like, like you said, it's a, uh, like your brain synapses are, are, are off or, you know, every, and it's kind of like everybody's, but ours, especially because of all the tra trauma we've experienced. But then once you do that treatment, it's like, they just kind of line back up or they, it's like a reset of a computer. Like I think you bet. You bet. And again, and they like, like for me, it's just, it's just an engine rebuild or an engine tune up, you know, as, as far as that goes. And again, I, I, I think metaphorically, we end up taking better care of our cars than we do our body or our mind, <laughs> sure. you know? So like in, in, in Air Force vernacular, like what do we do to send our body or mind into depot level maintenance? <laughs> right. You know, like, like how, how do we really just kind of deconstruct everything, clean it all out, f flush it out, put that together. So the, 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 the psychedelics for me were, were a mental depot level maintenance that ha I mean, I've been a completely different person. And if you talk to my wife, Allison, she absolutely ag agrees. And again, like not, not that I was bad, or whatever, but like her, like her whole thing is like, I have my husband back again. Yeah. I mean, people don't realize, like you just said, I mean, we don't, you, you thought you were fine or you thought you didn't need it. You thought you're high energy, whatever. A lot of us don't realize what's going on and we don't, we don't, we can't see we inward, you know, we're just, we only see outward. So we don't understand the kind of effect we're having on everybody else. And, um, and like you said there, you mentioned drinking before that's the worst thing you can do. I mean, that's the horror. That's what a lot of guys do. They don't have that. They don't have this out. They don't have this kind of, you know, structure with the, with the psychedelic. So they just drown it with alcohol. And for some guys it's fine and they can maintain, but I mean, it's just, it's not helping anything. It's just, you're just keeping going, you're going down the same road and you're not getting any better. So. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I, I went down there for, for treatment and for, for the, the viewers or, or listeners who may not know the, the two drugs we, we did were Ibogaine and then five MEO DMT, but coming out of that, I didn't drink for a year and a half. And again, it's not like I, I felt like I, I couldn't like, I literally had no desire to drink. Right. Like it was, it was the, the, the craziest thing now. So even now, like I rarely have casual drinks. And again, I love to drink, right? I love everything about <laughs> it. I love the fun. I love the, the laughter. So even now, like when, when we get together in big groups, I will still drink to do that. But I, I drink, I, I probably cut my drinking down by 80 or 90% th through this. And again, just because inherently, I think my, my body knows, you know, how, how that works. It's, it is, it has been crazy. And the, the, the odd part is there's still a lot of people who look at psychedelics. I think like how you and I grew up, like expand your mind and, you know, yeah. see the, you know, like, so there, like there's, there's stuff, a small yeah. measure. Yeah. You know? And so, and again, like they're, they're, they, they're, they're so negative with it. And I, I've even stopped people with that. I don't care what your, what your, your research says. I don't care what, what, what your studies tell you, right? <laughs> you don't know until you know. Sure. You know, so, so getting and finding out for yourself is that, that, that first thing, because again, like the, the proof is in the pudding. And I, I, I really hope that there's a lot of people who are open-minded enough to give psychedelic treatment a, a chance. And again, like, like the, the, I, I began, like we, we call it plant med medicine. And I honestly, I truly believe in the medicine aspect. I rarely do re recreational drugs at all. But the, the, the stuff that I do uh, dabbling in psilocybin and, and such is done with or through the lens of I, I want to fix my brain. I want to write myself. Right. I, I, I want to, uh, you know, align thoughts and actions and, and putting all, all that together. So uh, so like as far as me and psychedelics, I never do it for a good time. Sure. I do it for some benefit. Which is the point. I mean, it's the. Kind of to your point, it's like the propaganda of it says this: the these psychedelics are bad, and it's it's always been that way. But then, but why? I mean, this ibogaine. I I'm under the impression. I think it's a natural, like you just said, it's plant based. It's not a it's not a chemically made, you know, like in a, in a lab somewhere. Whereas, like you know, a lot of the a lot of the 
pain meds that the VA gives out to you is uh, their chemical, you know, they are horrible pills or whatever that they're making in, they're making in a, sci- a scientific lab. So it just, it, I, I think the propaganda is out there. The pharmaceutical companies are like, I've asked, I sound like a broken record. I say that on every time we bring it up. I'm, but but it's, just, it's true. I mean, these guys are pushing this agenda where they want you to buy these drugs that are, you know, backed by uh, these big pharmaceutical companies instead of just going the natural route. I mean, you know, so anyway. Well, like, like even, even that, like the, you know, when you, like when when you come out of the room, like there's no billions in a cure. There's billions in treatment. Sure, exactly. But there's no right. billions in a cure. Like they're not interested in finding a cure for you. I can right. promise you that. They're interested in finding a way to help you, right? To do that. But again, like, and I don't want to be as bold as to imply that psychedelics are a cure for PTSD. Sure. But man, is it close! Like it, <laughs> it is, it is uh, like dangerously and amazingly close, right? So I don't want to misrepresent that for everybody. I don't want to say that that it cured me, but as as much as I can say that I feel cured for how, I any mean, like for me, how I understand my emotions, how I deal with my like, I'm so much better with death now. I can talk about death. I can like before before like, and again, I I, I try to be very emotionally intelligent, but if if I got in a bad mood over one thing, I would bring in all my negative emotions because of that, that one catalyst and it would right. hit all of my emotions. And I, I don't want to say compartmentalize because I, I don't believe that that is the right phrase, but what I'm better able to do now is take that anger, take that frustration, take that sadness as that individual thing, right? right. It doesn't have to affect all the other trauma or negativity that I'm going through or that, that I've seen. And I'm, I'm perhaps isolate is better than that, right? Cause I'm not trying to compartmentalize it because I, I think that implies you kind of put stuff away, right? Which I, I don't believe. And I, I feel like I'm a very open and honest person, but, but again, like it's, it has been amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. So did you, uh, you mentioned something about the, uh, the fracture site event, the investigation. Did you want to touch on that or do you, uh, but if yeah. you don't want to talk about it, it's okay. No, it was, it was, it was one of those things to where like, uh, you know, I didn't see the end result of that for like another six years, but it was, oh, okay. it was, uh, it, 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 it isn't cool. Right. But what had happened was in the fall of 2006, some Canadians were killed when an A-10 uh, took an errant strafe and killed some Canadians that were sadly using like a porta john. Oh man. Like on Jeez. an adjacent ridge line. And it was like they'd attack target and just mis ID'd and then came in and, and strafed. So at the time that the USAFI commander, General Hobbins, was putting together kind of like a fact finding team, tiger team, whatever you wanted to figure out how something like this could happen. And so one of one of the initial questions was what are the differences in training? between us and nato forces what does this look like what what are the standards how well are we adhering to this are people showing up fully trained to put that together so so there was me and an a10 pilot from spangdalem who went down there as the the quote unquote cast experts and we we kind of split off so uh i went to different areas in like rc east and rc north um you know we had some of the the us based stuff was fine but we went to go talk to some of the in, international stuff so we're like Pauli Comrie, Mazari Sharif, uh, going out there, uh, doing interviews, talking to some of the, the, the multinational JTACs, figuring out their training pipeline, what were their qualifications, what was the certifications, not only for their qualifications, and then how did, what were their currency requirements coming into theater? How do yeah. they prove that, right? Who checked it, putting all, the, all, all that together. So, so the, the report that I helped write, uh, put that together. And it was really nice because I ended up getting, I didn't get like an, an, an award or a medal or anything, but I got like a formalized printed out thank you letter from General Hobbins that was handed to my boss and said, hey, tell, tell Chashi thanks. Right. And wow, so like, nice. I've, I've got, and again, like it, it didn't feel like platitude. It's probably a, a form letter. The way it was written did, didn't, didn't go that way. But then when I went back to Afghanistan, cause I went there you know, at the end of 2006, initially did some follow-up stuff in, in 2007. And then when I got back to Afghanistan in 2012, I saw the end result of that. And I saw the in-country certification where you had to talk to the senior JTAC manager, show them the training records, show the, the, the current. So like I watched the formalized process from what I believe I helped build from the initial oh, sure. fact finding for that. So that, that ended up, and I, I don't think I've ever told anybody that quite honestly, because I, awesome. 
it's very arrogant to probably say like I helped start that. Yeah, right. But I, I, I honestly believe. Uh, no, I don't think I, it, I, I, I don't think I, you I that way. Not at all. No, I think it. I think it came up exactly as it should have. Like you, you put in the work. You, you, you did a service to all of us who have to had to go over there because I mean it was a little loose in the beginning, and you know depending on what service you were, or what nationality you were, I mean it, who knows who where these guys were getting their qualifications, and that's yeah. a people forget that like being a JTAC that you can it it may not be the hardest thing to do, but it's the it can have the one of the biggest effects on the battlefield. Like, I mean, if you do the wrong thing as a JTAC, I mean, that's devastating to hundreds and if not thousands of people. You know, I mean, it, it can be really horrible. So, yeah, I mean, it. it I think, I, to your credit, I think you putting in that work probably saved lives. Frankly, I hope so. Right, and, and again, if, if it's uh, if it helps save good guys and kill bad guys, I'm happy to t- tie my name to that. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, like, but like, I, I I I think you and I have seen some of those tiger teams or things happen. Like, okay, I'm gonna put in my input, and this isn't gonna go anywhere, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm gonna make this comment. Like, you never see the end result of that. I saw what I believe to be the end result of the end, not, not just me, but the, the entire team. And like even, even uh, two of the Germans that I worked with and one of them uh, primarily Ingo Langhaga, um, he and I still, still keep in contact, right. Oh, for cool. all the stuff that we're able to, to, to put together. It was, it was a really phenomenal experience in, in, in my life. And again, I, I, I think we were able to do a whole lot of goodness right at a bare minimum, prevent a whole lot of badness from happening. Sure. Definitely. Well, did you want to, um, I know since you, you said you got out, you've done a heck of a lot of things since you've been out. I do you want to go through each one? And I definitely want to hit on Cape Lead. Obviously, that's what your your endeavor is right now, uh, and Black Rifle. If you want to talk about that, and, and also um, Le Nine D, are you still involved with that? I saw you on the I website. Am. Yeah, you're still involved with that. So yeah, do you want to talk about each one of those? And give us some inf- information about those. And, yeah. Uh, so, so the 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 LE nine D is lead, um, is is as far as that goes, and that is uh, an amazing collaboration with uh, with SEAC retired John Troxel. Yeah. And so, so John and I met through a, a mutual friend on a Black Rifle music video shoot, and I was telling that guy all my Cape stuff, and the, the, he's like, he's like, you need to talk to Troxel. I'm like, you know, I'm not sure a 38 year soldier and like a 20 year CSM is going to like some of my nuanced thoughts of leadership and how we get away from some of the <laughs> obedience versus discipline. And that's sure. all we could have a whole other conversation. Like what we thought we were taught in basic training was military discipline. Mm-mm, we were taught obedience. And again, I'm not saying that that's bad. There's a time and a place for that, but largely due to advancements in technology and communications, we need to get away from obedience and we need to focus on true leadership, better communication, th- th- things of that nature. But I, I kind of had that conversation with John and he's like, dude, all on board, brother. He's like, let's, let's do this. And so he and I did a proof of concept about, I think coming up on two years ago at JBLM, we had some five ASOS dudes in, in, in the room hosted by, by five ASOS had some soldiers come over to kind of go through John and I presented, I put all, all my Cape stuff and he does his stuff for not only strategic perspective, but transformational leadership on what he mm-hmm. was able to do. How he, he was able to communicate very effectively, mind you, like with all of the services as, as is built out. And so we, we went through, we're like, dude, I, I think we're onto something. And, and we, we, we told the guys like, Hey, free of charge. We're not going to do this, but at the end of the day, like we absolutely w- w- want feedback. And when one, one of the soldiers raised his hands, and he's like, "He's like, how long have, have you guys been doing this?" We're like, yeah, this this is our this is our first time putting this together. And like the whole audience was like, "What?" <laughs> like that was that was flawless. Like like you guys, we would have thought you've been doing this for months and months and months. Like no, this is our first time. And John's like, I haven't even seen half these slides. <laughs> like, you know, and so, and, it, and like, holy cow, like we are onto something. We did a second proof of principle, like this time last year at seven ASOS down in El Paso, had some uh, students from the Sergeant Major Academy come over to sit nice. in and again, cause like we want this, this perspective. And again, met with sim- similar results as just as far as like good advanced content, not hokey, providing actual skills. And again, just good, you know, the, the, the whole great part about John is, is he, he, he can speak to anybody, right? He can draw a great conversation, but then, you know, out of his 38 years, like 20 of them, like, like 20, if not 20 plus, like 21, 22 years as an E9, Oh, jeez. you know, for, for, for doing it. So like that in and of itself just breeds an understanding of, of strategic perspectives, strategic oh, operations, yeah. 
e- execution, right? Just, just phenomenal. And again, getting unfettered access to him in a classroom environment. Cause it's not like you, you see CJCS is out there with that, that right. type of stuff. They're not, they're not doing that. So, so their, their access to John is the leather bucket seats of this entire experience. So sure. anything that I bring to the table is largely just sprinkles right on top of John's like foot, like fully b- baked in plan, which is a whole lot of fun. But like, even, even that, like people seem to resonate with the whole Cape Cape leadership stuff. And so the, the, the brief little, little pitch on that is again, I, I was studying the word expectations and I've been studying that for years and years and years because like no one can define it or like even this, like I, I, you like, you, even if you want to take a crack at this or anyone who's watching or, or listening, <laughs> take a quick second to Google quotes on expectations. Because like any leader that I talk to and any, any, any classes he ended up teaching, we do like, okay, show of hands who here, uh, uses or has heard the phrase expectation management, the hands go up. Like who here knows how important and vital it is to set solid expectations. All the hands go up. I'm like, cool. Who here can define what an expectation is? And then crickets. Like who here has gotten a distinct class? Cause this is what we do. We make sure that people are specifically trained and certified to do a thing. Like who here has gotten this for expectation management? Who knows the actual steps for managing e- expectations? And then crickets. But then, and then, then I, I, I go further. I was like, so we as leaders know how important it is to lead expectations. Yay, huge win. But then when I asked him to Google quotes about expectations, like 95 plus percent are negative. Yeah. Like overwhelmingly ne- negative. Shakespeare says expectations are the root of all, all heartache. Brene Brown um, one of the greatest thought leaders of our time, focusing on vulnerability and shame. Like she's absolutely phenomenal. Maybe like a PhD out of U- University of, of Houston. She says expectations are resentments waiting to happen. Right. So like, which is, which is fine. But like, at the end of the day, that, that's like, so how do, how do leaders love expectations and the rest of the world hates expectations? And how do we reconcile these two concepts? And so that, that, that is, is my, my work now, which then leads us into Cape and then Cape is born off of airstrikes, you know? So, so realistically an airstrike is nothing more than a great conversation. So this is a conversation from ground to the air, air to ground at a bare minimum between two different people who are going to attack the problem from two completely different positions with two completely different skill sets, two completely different perspectives. And we're getting this conversation right every fucking time. Yeah. Like every time for 20 plus years, multiple times a day when, when we're, 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 we're talking about GWAT with hardly a screw up. Right. So it's like, how does this happen? Well, an airstrike is nothing more than a conversation where we know the very minimum amount of information that needs to be passed in order to be successful. We can ask questions and seek clarification without being confrontational or argumentative, you know, like we know the important things that, that we need to have readbacks on to make sure we didn't miss hear or, or, or misspeak, put all that together. Like, like that, that's how an airstrike works. So what can we do to leverage that same mindset and modality on our daily lives, right? To, to, to put this together, to make sure that we're communicating as effectively as we do with airstrikes for the most simple and innocuous of, of things. And that's like, as, as I went through the whole Cape thing, like, what do we care about? How well aligned are, are how well aligned are we to achieve what we care about? What are the different perspectives and priorities at play? And then lastly, what is the expectation moving forward? Not the hope, not the assumption, not the anticipation, but the expectation moving forward. And obviously I have multiple classes that kind of dive down into it, but at a bare minimum, that's that that's how that works, right? And so you know, for all the conversations that, that, that we, we think we have, um, you know, we, we don't have in like a lot of the right. stuff that we have is, is bullshit. Like the, the example that, that I use is let's say that you're going to come down here to, to Phoenix, Arizona. You hit me up like, Hey, Hey Chachi, I'm coming down to Phoenix, be there for, for a few days. Uh, going to leave about noon on Saturday. What, what are your plans Friday night? You want to go out, tear it up. So what do I do? I have to ask my wife, Allison, like, Hey, <laughs> JD's coming down here, right? He wants to know if I can link up for, for dinner and drinks on Friday night. So my wife says, okay, cool. What time are you coming home? I'm like, well, I don't know about maybe two, three in the morning. I may want to push it up a little bit, hit the casino a bit, you know, who knows? And she goes, well, how about midnight? And I say, okay, you know, and then, and then like, as, as we, we, teach these classes and I tell people and, and I, I have people raise their hands like who here has had that, that measure of conversation? 
and nearly every hands go up. Like, you know, like, and that's your average relationship -y type of question. And I can go out and I can have a good time. As long as I'm back by midnight, everything's fine. And yay, good, solid, positive communication happened. Woo <laughs> Other than that was complete bullshit. Like absolute bullshit. We talked of nothing of substance absolutely nothing because if she says midnight midnight's completely arbitrary compared to my behavior i could show up at three in the morning totally sober because I, I i drove us around and everything's fine or maybe we start off with shots and i'm home at 11 o'clock at night because i'm passed right. out naked in my front lawn <laughs> right. you know and all of a sudden my wife's pissed I'm like i'm back by midnight like what <laughs> i don't mm -hmm. <laughs> you know or, like and, and or why, why midnight, right? So presumably she's trying to curb my behavior in some way, either mm -hmm. to curb badness or save, you know, energy for awesomeness later. But what was that like? Did she have something going on Friday night? Did she have something going on Saturday morning? Did I have something? Did our kids have something? Like, like we talked about none of that. And yet we think it was a good conversation. Yeah. So like throughout this whole content, this whole study of expectations and putting together Cape, I no longer ask her if I can have permission Friday night, because now I just say, Hey, J JD is coming into town. Uh, he's free Friday night. He wants to meet up for, for dinner and drinks. What are our expectations for this weekend? Like without me teaching a thing or like that question in and of itself changes the dynamic of that communication 100% because now it's up for me to be as open and honest as possible. It's up for her to be as open and honest as possible so that she puts everything on, on, on the table. I put everything on the table and then we see if it's really okay if I can go out. Maybe we've got too much stuff and I self-assess like, hey, G, hey J JD, I'm happy to meet out. Hey, if we meet up earlier, I could probably stay out till 10. I've got an early morning tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. now do that. Or if we've got nothing, like, babe, I never see him. Like, he and I didn't get to hang out to our entire careers. Like, <laughs> I, I, I want to spend time with the guy. He seems rad. Like, we're, I think we're going to get a little bit crazy. She's like, all right, y'all, I'll, I'll cover down on Saturday. Right. But yeah. I, we're able to have those conversations because we're looking through the lens of expectations. And that is my goal to bring to the world. That makes a lot of sense. That's awesome. And, and it, uh, you know, like, like the, like the, the other weird example is like when chicks do bachelorette parties in Vegas inevitably like i've rarely heard a story of a bachelorette party going well because they haven't caped this right they haven't figured out what everybody cares about or how well we're aligned because inevitably there's a woman or two who wants to go off or do her own thing or like she wants to make sure that they go clubbing well the bride and the bridal party may not want to do that well then yeah. they start fighting because they didn't have this conversation uh ahead of time you know so th there's there's all this ish that we allow into our conversations that we're really able i don't want to say eradicate but really able to really cut out of uh, a lot of our conversations if again we just look and communicate through the lens of expectations yeah that's awesome man so are you and john uh, john so do you guys do, do you sprinkle the cape in with the lead yes and, yes okay okay so so, so yeah, so I, I I have my company Cape, and he has his company PME Hard, right? Uh, physically, uh, me mentally, emotionally hard, right? And how how to train those those, those skills and, and that mindset. So lead the L E nine, like E nine in in the middle, gotcha. is our is our collaborative. <laughs> A program, not necessarily a company, but a program that, that he and I come together on that mashes all of my CAPE leadership study with his strategic perspective and focus on transformational leadership and over, overlay that with each other. And that, okay. that has been a ton of fun. The, the synergy with that seems to be amazing. So he's got his company, I have mine. And then like we were just out, uh, you know, we talked to different, like we taught at um, Luke Air Force Base here a little bit ago. We were at Robbins Air, Air Force Base a little while ago. Um, he and I just actually, as I said, I went University of Health and Performance on the border of Arkansas and, and o Oklahoma with a, a, a veteran by the name of Matt Hesse, who has been wildly successful in his civilian life and is building this university to really give back to the veteran space, to help them learn tangible, practical, tactical skills. So he and I went out there to talk to him to see if there's any collaboration that, that, that can be done. And I don't know if that's happening, but yeah, you know, who, but again, just like, like Matt just seems like a, a straight shooter who just want, wants to help, you know, and so whether he does that with, with lead or me or not, like if he were to ask me any favor, like Matt, I'm in your corner, brother, 24 seven. Nice. Is there, is there an easy way for guys to get a hold of you to say they want you to bring them out to their ASOS or, or any other unit to, to talk? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, so it's easy. Chachi at capelead.com. So C-H-A-C-H-I uh, as, as they're on the screen at cape, C-A-P-E-L-E-A-D.com. And the thing that I, 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 I tell people is is hit, hit me up on, on my cell. My number is 602-621-0821. Um, <laughs> and, and again, it's one of those like, like you know, 
we, we can't have the good conversations if we're not talking. So, sure. so figuring out how that works. <laughs> so people can hit me up morning, noon or night. A couple other things I want to talk about. You, you were the tech P association vice president, and then you were the president. Um, but now you're the executive director of the, the BRCC fund. Yes. You touched on earlier. Um, and you know, I obviously the philanthropic arm of the of product rifle, but do you want to go into a little more detail about that? Kind of tell us what you do and what you've done maybe. Yeah, it is, it is, it is really amazing. So I, uh, you know, I spent that year being JT's exec and then they, they were kind of leaning into like really his area of expertise with that, with, with strategic partnerships. So then, uh, as they were kind of leaning more into that, he's like, he's like, Hey Tim, he's like, what if I just push you over to corporate? All right. And you do strategic partnerships. So that, that, that happened. So I did strategic partnerships with like the time, like our 80 different strategic partners and influencers and, and helping kind, kind of organize and, and put all, all that stuff together uh, as Black Rifle was preparing to go public, right? So, so to put more, so, some of the formality, they moved me out of that role. And then I, I did some like bounced around for like a, a month or two. And then in December of 22, at like a marketing symposium in, in Salt Lake City, uh, Evan Hafer came up to me, like the, the, the CEO and founder of, of Black Rifle. And he's like, Chachi, I think I have the next role for you. I'm like, go ahead. He's like, hey, I, I, I think I'm looking at you to take over Black Rifle Philanthropy. And I'm like, you're kidding me. And he's like, no, how do you feel about that? And I literally showed him goosebumps on my arm. I'm like, if that tells you, like, and again, and then I, you know, there are so many, like, num, num, number one, Black Rifle makes great coffee. They make award winning coffee, but their whole thing is we want to sell good coffee and we want to support veterans. So, yeah. so to be that guy who helps wrestle and orchestrate all that stuff on behalf of Black Rifle, you know, to, to distribute inside a, a coherent philanthropic plan is, I, I truly believe I, I have the best job inside all of, of Black Rifle. So that that started kind of early spring last year. Um, and then just kind of no, normalize and formalize that process. And a lot of that was we just really had to get a little bit more uh, strategic and involved because as we started going into to grocery stores, they're trying to build in philanthropy to a lot of those, those, those business deals. So, uh, you know, so for a, a, at least one of the business deals and maybe another one there is kind of like overcharging them, like XX amount of cents per bag, whatever that, that, that may be. Right. Uh, and then to say, Hey, like, as we do this, this will go towards philanthropy, like fund yeah. philanthropy. So like for a lot of things, like I don't have to use a lot of my time it was like nonprofits spend a great deal of their time fundraising to put that together. Sure. So, so I don't have to do that by and large. And so finding out the, the great worthwhile recipients. And again, you know, it's, it's not like there's a lot of, we stay away from all the big nonprofits only because black rifle truly wants to make a difference. We want to move the needle. We want to have impact, right? So there's a lot of great, huge like multi tens and hundreds of million dollars nonprofit that we will never touch, but for all the right reasons. And they're doing sure. everything right. We're, we're, we're not talking smack, but again, like, like we, we want to do more. You know, one of the things that happened last year was um, Evan had lost a friend and a green beret to cancer. So he hit me up. He's like, Chachi, who do we know over at, at Hunter seven, who is like a cancer studies and a cancer screening type of not nonprofit. I was like, well, I know the executive director, Ch Chelsea. And so Chelsea had reached out. So we were able to do a collaboration with the UFC, right. To help raise money oh. for, for Hunter seven, like a, a, a matching donation. So I think we were going to match up to, uh, in collaboration with the UFC match up to $125,000. And I think like the online donations and stuff went over like 130 or so. Right. So, wow. so we were able to get them like a ton of money leveraging black rifle influence, leveraging the black, black rifle me media machine. And at the end of the day, really just leveraging the passion of Evan Hafer, Matt Best, and Jared Taylor. And like those, those three dudes have not wavered at all in the black rifle support to veterans. And anytime it's like, Hey, can we help out these guys? Can we help out th those guys? Obviously there's a whole lot of like, they're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of black rifle as, as they shouldn't be as big sure. as it is right now. But as far as like the, the, the media, the social media, the, the, the podcast, they're, they're still looking to make sure, uh, holding my feet to the fire to make sure that we've got a good plan to, to support veterans and a well articulated plan that anybody can kind of latch on to. I mean, it seems like in the very beginning, that was that was the goal. That was like, no matter what happens, they're going to do something for the veteran community. You bet. And, you know, 
and then like it's like I'm actually taking off tomorrow uh, to fly out to to Baltimore because uh, we're going to try and donate a lot of our coffee to the first responders in and around the Baltimore, Maryland oh, area, yeah. right in in support of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And we're going to bring along Tra- Travis Pastrana. He's our like probably premier uh, strategic partner as as far as this goes. Uh, re- reached out to him. He's like, hey, would, would you want to help? He said, absolutely. Uh, he's from Annapolis, a, a little bit south, but uh, oh, you know. Okay. If, big like flies in and out of baltimore you know huge fan so we asked him you know jumped at the chance to do that so i uh, i think people will be seeing us you know donating uh on media or social media here very soon nice that's awesome they they seem very like since the beginning it's always been veteran focused and you know very um altruistic i guess is what i want to say you know you know it is it's it's very hard like in a in a room or community full of snake eaters to say the word purity you know <laughs> as, as, as far as that goes but so help me god those guys are pure of focus right yeah. when, when when it comes there like they they want to make sure that veterans get support. Now, obviously we have to sell coffee in order to, to, to donate coffee. And, and sure, obviously sure. we've got a fiduciary responsibility to, to, to stockholders and it always, it isn't always that, that easy, but, but all, all of those, those gentlemen, uh, I, I get texts from, you know, at least on a quarterly basis, uh, you know, putting that together, like, like, like JT's doing a lot of his stuff. I, I probably talked to Matt best the, the most, <clears throat> um, Evan has recently stepped down as CEO as like one January of, of this year, but okay. he's still like chairman of the Black Rifle Inc. board, uh, obviously st- still doing his podcast, so so he's not in that role, but but he's still he- heavily involved, and they're they're still telling the stories of veterans, they're still telling the stories of our our, our warriors. So so w- whatever whatever business they may or may not be doing, they are absolutely doing their passion to support sure. veterans on a weekly basis. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, one other thing I want to mention before we go, uh, you, you yourself have a podcast, which I've been listening to, which I find, I love it. Um, it's the, the thing, the things I love about it. I know my podcast is always super long. So people have a hard time listening to the whole thing at once, but yours is like, yours is it's straightforward. It's digestible. It's, it, it, it's relevant. And, uh, I just think it's awesome. I just wanted to say that first of all, I mean, you, the, that Cape lead podcast is just great. I think it's, I think you're doing a great job with that. And I think it's, like I said, you you give these nuggets of information and you, they're, they're, I, I don't have to sift through a bunch of, you know, extraneous BS, you know, uh, I, it's right there and you, you, you boil it down. It's great. So I just wanted to say thanks for doing that. And it's awesome. Thank you. And again, like I, I, I always try and, and, and do more. And again, like this is absolutely my, 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 my passion, like the whole leadership side of things is, is, is like if, if I won the lottery tonight, I would still want to, to teach leadership, you know, as sure, far as that sure. goes. So, so uh, I, I really, and again, I, I, it, the last two years where I've been full-time with Black Rifle, cause they, they should get the majority of my effort. If I'm a oh, full-time I'm salary yeah. in, in like, and a director inside of an amazing brand, they get my focus, <laughs> you know? Right, right. And so, so like my, yeah. my, my, my podcast have super trailed off, but I, I really appreciate that, that feedback. And, and I, I, I try and do more. And again, but it's funny. Cause like there are people like, like you need to do longer episodes. Like, well, I, I get that too. Like my, my whole thing is I wanted it digestible in, in one drive into work. You know, so most, so I, I, I try and keep mine, but below 20 minutes, but again, I love the, these, these longer ones as well. So whether it's, whether it's you, whether it's, it's, it's Rogan, right. This to where like, you really get a feel for a, a human, right. Rather sure. than me, like I've got some, I've got, I, I've got a leadership podcast. I've got 20 minutes of leadership stuff. You're only going to get leadership content for me, but podcasts like, like, like yours, um, you know, people get to see humanity. People get to see personality. People get to see, you know, unscripted witty banter here and there, you know, probably some inappropriate stuff, some F bombs. <laughs> um, but yeah. you know, like that, that, that's the stuff that I think speaks to, um, at least our generation and a yeah. lot of the younger generation that I believe is just looking for truth wherever they can find it. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. I, I, I want, uh, I want to kind of capture the whole story of guys like you, you know, cause you hear, you hear little snippets of things here and there, but you don't really get the whole story unless you're, unless you let the guy dig into his whole past. So, yeah. You bet. Well, Chachi, this has been awesome, man. I knew it was going to be, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate you taking your time to do this and um, uh, good luck with everything you're doing. And just, uh, we spread the word about Cape lead and, you know, uh, everything that uh, John's doing. Um, and frankly about, I think the one of the biggest things uh, with this audience is the, 
um, the treatment, the vets. I, mean, I think that's yeah. a big, uh, big deal. Cause I, you know, and like you said, I, I don't, know, I don't, I know we're wrapping up and I don't want to get back into something, but, uh, if people have a, it's very, they have a negative connotation sometimes with stuff like that. And I think that people need to open their minds and, um, kind of, you know, be a little more willing to find some alternative treatments. 100%. And again, if, if there's anyone out there who's listening, who can reconcile like the, the, the point we, we made earlier in that there's no money in a cure, Right. I think that opens our aperture a little bit to really start looking at things that may have been pushed aside or maybe we did negative press about like, I don't want to get into COVID and ivermectin type stuff other than right. in the aggregate. Right. Ivermectin seems to be pretty rad, but it got neg- negative press. So so I, I I hope that there's a lot of people out there who are now even more open minded, maybe that they were during COVID to realize that. There's some big money to be made in that type of quarantine scenario, right? And or and or ah, I'm, I'm trying not to try and say a political, uh, you know, as far as this goes. Other than it was a horrible situation, and again, there's no money in a cure. Right. So let's let's it's, figure it's out not, what's right. It's not crazy or bad to be skeptical. I mean, I think that I think inherently as a as a, an American, we should be skeptical. I mean, you shouldn't just blindly follow anything, whether it be the government or you know this company or whatever. I mean, you should do your due diligence and push. You know, question some things sometimes. I don't think that's I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, well, when we blindly just, follow. Yeah, like don't like don't people don't be a sheep, right? Whether whether it's it's like and anything, don't blindly follow. Be cautiously optimistic, right? But again, like be very very critical. And again, yeah. like I don't think my wife's like you keep pointing out where I'm wrong. I'm like I'm critiquing you. She's like don't do that. I'm like I'm like no no, no. like you're taking my critique as a judgment, right? Sure. Like my my critique is you did that wrong. A judgment is you did that wrong because you're a dumbass. Right. Like, no, <laughs> right. I'm just in exactly. fact saying you did that wrong. Like this just is not, pointing something out. Yeah. Like, that's hey, it, right. This, this is a flaw in this situation. That's it. Yeah, Let's like, try to that fix is it. A, or, that is an ugly baby. Not that you're an ugly person or you dropped him. Just saying that is an ugly baby. Like, <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. I really appreciate it. This was great. Um, and uh, yeah, good luck with all that stuff. I, I I really wish you the best uh, in that uh, in those endeavors. I, I like the I, I like that Cape Lead uh, idea. I mean, I think that's a great concept. I think you really oh, got something there. Thank you. I, I definitely uh, appreciate. It. And again, if I have any time or opportunity to, to collaborate, in, you know, in the future, would absolutely love to. And any time I'm back up in in your neck of the woods, I will absolutely make sure to reach out. Please do. Please do. We'll do. All right, brother. 